Hello students and welcome to my video on cell membranes and cellular transport. This video is meant to help you with your upcoming assessment. Like all my videos, it is free, it does not cost anything, and it can't be used for profit. Uh, throughout, I'll use some images from Khan Academy and those are accessible on KhanAcademy.org. Here's a beautiful picture that I took in Jebel Akhtar this past weekend. I went up there on a hike uh, near the Anantara Resort. Um, just one of my favorite places in Oman. And so this is going to deal with water. Right and the diffusion of water um, and how that's going to be important to life. So let's dive right in. All right, here are some questions for you. If you can do all nine of these questions, you don't need to watch the video. Um, you could spend your time uh, somewhere else. Maybe you could dive deeper or try some AP problems or really research hyponatremia. So let's go through them together. How did the structure of phospholipids lead to their function of making the cell membrane? Can you describe that fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane? What things can easily cross the cell membrane in passive transport or diffusion? What items cannot cross the cell membrane and must use a protein channel? Can you compare and contrast passive and active transport? Can you describe how the sodium potassium pump works? If you're watching this video early, we haven't gotten to do the sodium potassium model. Um, I do want to uh, thank Forrest for setting it up, and we will have that ready for you next week. How can someone die from drinking too much water? That's very sad. Why do you gargle salt water when you have a swollen throat? And which way would water flow in cells that are placed in solutions that are hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic relative to the cell? Why is that important? A lot of big vocab words. I had a talk with uh, one of the students, and if you're watching this, you'll know who you are. Um, and she said she was just lost when I was up there talking about hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic. I'll try and do a better job breaking down this vocab words for you and saying why they're important to be able to use that terminology. All right. So here's the first one. How did the structure of these phospholipids lead to their function of making the cell membrane? Well, if you remember from previous lessons, the phospholipids have a phosphate group attached to these uh, fatty acid chains or tails. This group up here is water loving. It is polar, it is hydrophilic. All those things mean that it interacts well with water. They will point towards water in the cell. The fatty acid tails are repelled by water and are hydrophobic. Those are nonpolar molecules. They do not like water. They will bunch up together to form this nonpolar um, inside of the cell membrane. So this would be nonpolar in here, out here enjoys water, right? And so that forms energetically favorably. It doesn't require any energy to do that. So these give, um, the, or these make the cell membrane. Uh, cell membranes are, have been around since the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. They're very important. They compartmentalize the cell. If the cell membrane is punctured, it can heal itself, but if it's too big of a puncture, the cell is going to it, lose all of its insides or its guts and it's gonna die. So very important. All right, the fluid mosaic model. Um, I, this is like an old school video that we watched, but I think it was just really nice. It showed how it's dynamic, the cell membrane um, moves around, it can fix itself, it can repair itself. And the way we practiced this was with the bubble lab. And so hopefully you really enjoyed um, doing the bubbles and poking pencils through your fingers through, making uh, peripheral proteins, et cetera. So I'm not worried about you memorizing all the names of proteins that go through the, the cell membrane. But what I do want you to know is that the cell membrane is fluid. It is not stiff like a picture, it moves it can squeeze, it can repair itself, and that it repels charged molecules. All right, which items can easily cross the cell membrane? Things that are nonpolar and that are small cross the membrane very easily. Nonpolar means that it has an equal distribution of electrons in it. I would need to tell you in uh, introductory biology whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar. You're not at the point yet or you can figure it out on your own probably. Maybe you are, and if so, that's awesome. So in this picture, the lipid or the oils would be able to easily cross the membrane, but a sugar cannot. Sugar has uh, different charged areas and it's a big molecule. Okay. 
So let's look at a couple of these. There are specific channels for each um, of these charged molecules that need to get in. So sugar has a specific transport protein. It's called the GLUT4 protein that insulin calls for so that glucose can enter the cell. Different amino acids have specific channel. There are specific channels for chloride ions, for um, uh, sodium and potassium. There are specific channels for water. They're called aquaporins that allow water to come in and out of the cell because water is a polar molecule. Now, in many textbooks and in many places, you will also learn that water is so small and it's around here that it can squeeze through the lipid bilayer. And so you should know that water can go both through the channel, which is where the majority of water molecules go through, and can kind of squeak by the lipid bilayer. Like everything in life, there's always some exceptions. Salts, wastes, et cetera. All right. This is a flow chart from Bozeman Science. I just love his videos. I didn't make a playlist of them this time. I gave you the Amoeba Sisters, which I think are excellent as well. It may be a little more accessible to us. But if you look at this chart, you'll see that the big headings are, here's cellular transport. We need to get items in and out of cells. We're doing that to maintain homeostasis and to do the work of living and growing and being a human or being a plant or doing whatever we need to. Items that move passively do not require energy. And that could be through diffusion, just the movement of molecules from an area of high to low concentration, or facilitated diffusion, which is high to low concentration as well, but it needs a specific protein to help that. Osmosis deals with the movement of water. And so then, you know, in his video, the, these would connect as well. Um, that an example of diffusion would be oxygen and carbon dioxide. Osmosis deals with hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic solutions. And facilitated diffusion, the biggest example we use in introductory biology, is glucose transport. These are all passive transports. They do not require any energy. Active transport is going against the concentration gradient or from low to high, and that requires energy in the form of ATP. It can also involve endocytosis and exocytosis, which because a vesicle is being moved, the movement of that vesicle, like moving a, a TV or something, requires energy. All right. I have these in more in-depth coming up. So here is a nice um, animated GIF of the fusion. You can see it's starting at a high and spreading out. So um, when one of my students in class in B Block, you know who you are, opened up a perfume bottle and sprayed it because they didn't like the smell of the eggs and the oobleck in the room. It diffused from her perfume bottle throughout the room. Same thing for when um, some gentlemen come in and spray ax everywhere because they decided to play football when it's like 43 degrees outside. That'd be Celsius watching in the US. All right, spreading from high to low. There's no energy required. These molecules will remain. It, it, here's osmosis. This going to be diffusion of water. Same thing. These molecules will remain moving. So here we started out. They're high here. Here's the barrier. They're just moving in random vectors. And eventually that randomness will lead to them being equally distributed throughout the container. And so they will keep moving in randomness. So they're not going to stop moving. So if we reach equilibrium where everything's spread out uh, to the maximum, the molecules still move around. We did a little thing at your desk. I hope you liked it. We tried cold water and hot water. It wasn't as effective as I was hoping to be, so I need to revamp that. But you should have seen that in the hot water beaker, your food coloring diffuse much faster. Now here's an animated GIF of it, right? So this would be the hotter one. This would be the colder one. And it should be spreading out or diffusing more rapidly. Um, other things that can affect uh, uh, the rate of diffusion is the diffusion distance. So the larger the distance, the longer it takes for diffusion to happen. That makes sense. If I'm trying to smell your perfume, if I'm next to you, if, I, if I'm next to my wife, I can smell her perfume. Uh, but if my wife's further away, um, I'm not going to smell it as quickly. And so 
we did a, a pretty interesting gizmo. I hope you liked it. Um, not everybody completed it on chlorine gas poisoning and with that train derailment in South Carolina. And that chlorine gas irritated uh, the patient Anita's lungs and caused the diffusion distance to increase. Concentration difference also makes uh, a difference. This I'm not uh, as worried about in our class, um, but it's going to be the ratio of oxygen on one side and um, oxygen on the other side, right? So if there's a big difference. And so for our lungs getting oxygen into the bloodstream, um, it will help uh, with the rate of diffusion. The larger the difference, the quicker the rate of diffusion. So when she inhaled the chlorine gas, she had a smaller concentration difference. This is important with COVID um, in your alveoli, if they get um, full of fluid, it decreases the surface area. By decreasing the surface area, you have less space with which oxygen molecules can pass in and out of the cells. And so therefore you will slow down the rate of diffusion. These are just factors that affect the rate of diffusion. All right, here we got some examples of diffusion. Which way will the fat move? It will go from an area of high concentration. There's one, two, three, four, five, six fats out here, two here they will move into the cell. Our cells use up fats and sugars and amino acids and stuff to maintain a concentration gradient so that materials come in. All right, so we'll go from high to low. Same thing here for these sugars. No energy required to bring these sugars into the cell. They just pass through this protein channel. It'd be like if you passing through the doors of our school, like that's just the way you enter whereas air can enter in lots of different places. All right, that was passive transport. Um, just to reiterate, that dealt with diffusion and facilitated diffusion. I have saved water for later on in the presentation because um, that gave students the most uh, trouble. Water is still passive transport. It's just moving from areas of high water concentration to low. Sometimes we need to move uphill. And the best example of this is the sodium potassium pump. Or um, we also watched a quick video clip of moving magnesium ions and nitrates into the root hairs of plants. So it's low and it needs to go to an area of high. It's like trying to put the perfume back into the bottle or put the axe back into the body spray. That's going to require energy, ATP. Here's a sodium potassium pump example. So there's going to be less sodium on the inside of the cell than on the outside. All right, so there's, you're moving from an area of low to high, and the same thing for the potassium. It's moving from an area of low to high. Um, let's see if I have a picture of it. But it, it, it's gonna eventually what leads to action potential. So here's the sodium. There's the energy that energizes the pump. It kicks the sodiums out, it going from low to high out here, high out here. And then here, going from low to high as well, the potassium. All right. Okay, let's talk about osmosis. And so which way will water flow in these cells? So here we did the excellent biology lab. We dissolved the eggshells in acetic acid or vinegar we then place them in distilled water or syrup. And we had to use pancakes here, but it's fine. So what happened to the egg? Let's imagine that this is the egg that is placed in distilled water, or in this instance, 75% uh, pure water. So here it's 75% water on the extracellular side. The inside is 45% water. Which way will the water flow? Water is going to flow from high to low in osmosis. So it should flow into the cell trying to maintain or reach equilibrium. This solution on the outside is called hypotonic relative to the cell. You can remember that because it makes it blow up like a hippo, it makes it get big. So this solution out here is hypotonic relative to the cell. It's going from higher water concentration to lower water concentration. If you're a little more advanced, what it's really doing is it's going to surround this greater solute concentration. Here we can see us egg. This would be our egg placed in syrup, 
right? The egg might be 90% water, 10% solids, and then the syrup might be 63% water, 37% solids. Where will the water go? From high to low. So it's going to leave the egg. As it leaves the egg, it's going to shrink. A solution that causes the shrinking of a cell is called hypertonic. Both of these situations can lead to the death of the cell. If the cell loses all of its water, it's not going to work and it's going to die. If the cell gains too much water, it could eventually burst in a process called lysis. Here, 50% water, 50% water, what's going to happen, it's going to reach dynamic equilibrium. Water molecules still move in and still move out of the cell, but notice how I drew these arrows at the same magnitude. They're going to move at the same rate in and out of the cell. This solution is called isotonic relative to the cell. Isotonic relative to the cell. All right, so here are some slides on it. If it's hypotonic relative to the cell, there's going to be a higher concentration of water outside of it. It's going to cause the cell to swell and gain water. Um, there is an, a problem about a paramecium in your study guide that I would like for you to try and do, and that we'll do in class on our review day. And the paramecium is in a hypotonic environment, so water is continually rushing into the paramecium. It will need to pump it out, and it pumps it out with what's called a contractile vacuum. For plant cells, it's not an issue. Because plant cells have a cell wall, if they're in a hypotonic environment, the cell wall is able to push back against um, the water rushing in. And so that's what makes plants turgid or what makes them um, look fresh and plump. All right. Keeping the right amount of water in the cell, let's look at hypertonic. So if you were to put a cell in uh, salt water, it would lose water quickly and it would shrivel up and it could die. The plant can also die, right? It's going to lose water. It's going to wilt, and it's, it could die as well. Um, let's see. The solution would be to take up water. The right amount of water would be something that is isotonic, where there's no difference in this. And so this might be between blood and your cells in your body. And the water is going to flow equally across each membrane. You have hormones, you have diuretic and antidiuretic hormones that are going to help you maintain an isotonic balance of water in your body. Okay, here are some real life examples. And so we watched a video on it in the uh, radio show where the woman held her wee for a wee um, and she ended up passing away from having too much water. Her uh, blood became hypotonic relative to her cells, it caused her brain to swell. The, the cells in her brain intook water. It caused her brain to expand, but your brain is confined by your skull. And as it expanded, it ended up crushing um, her hypothalamus and other parts in the back of her brain, and she died from it. Um, it's a terrible, sad instance of people not thinking about biology before doing a crazy contest. Um, another example could be gargling salt water. And so why do we gargle salt water when we're sick? Think about that one. And why do we spray vegetables with uh, distilled water um, in a grocery store? All right, students, that was the shortest video. Review cellular transport. I encourage you to complete the Pogel. We're working on it in groups, and we didn't quite get through everything. And I think that will really help you with it. Peace out.